When Christine was murdered in 1952, it was clear to her close friends that the media worldwide would try and make a huge story out of this, that this would fantasize quite wrongly the nature of, of Christine's life and of Christine's death. That is why the four of us got together with the determination that Christine's reputation wouldn't be sullied by the obvious foolish interventions of the media throughout the world. The Shelbourne Hotel in London belonged to the Polish Relief Society. Whenever Christine came back from her voyages at sea, she always stayed in the same room. She was walking down the main staircase when Dennis Muldowney entered the hotel. Krysia odebrała bieliznę z pralni w hotelu i niosła ten cały pakiet czystej, wypranej, wypracowanej bielizny i on jak prawdziwy chirurg tym nożem trafił prosto w jej serce między tą paczką bielizny i jej ubraniem. Zabójca nie bronił się i właściwie prosił o wykonanie wyroku jak najszybciej, żeby być z nią razem. A zresztą z tego co wiem, to on był katolik, praktykujący i prawdopodobnie uczciwie wierzył, że się po śmierci spotkają. Czemu bijesz się z tym, czemu kryjesz się z tym, że mnie kochasz, dlaczego nie rozumiesz? Ja już wiem, że mnie chcesz, jestem wolna, ty też jesteś sam, czemu zdobyć mnie nie umiesz? O czym myślisz, gdy trzesz zadumany czoło? Twoja miłość to nasza jest rzecz. Tak jak powiedzmy na polach Flandry zakwitły maki, to ona była tym wspaniałym, cudownym kwiatem, którego ta wojna wywołała skądś tam, z ogromną odwagą. Ona była śliczna, a równocześnie mogła być niewidoczna. Ona umiała w tłumie zniknąć zupełnie. She dressed very, very simply, but it was wartime. None of us had any clothes. I mean, we were in uniform, of course, but um, I, I don't think she, no, I don't think she wore a uniform. I can't quite remember that. I think she was just in uh, skirts and blouses. Krysi Skarbek nie znałam przed wojną, ale słyszałam, mówiło się o tym o młodej dziewczynie, pełnej uroku, pełnej wdzięku. Pamiętam, że w domu często rozmaite piosenki, jak biały pokoik, jak cały szereg dowcipów z Momusa powtarzano między innymi. Słuchaj, hrabio, chadzaj równo, żebyś nie wpadł czasem w długi i nie żenił się z mośkówną, jak ten hrabia skarbek drugi. Christine's mother Stefania was the daughter of a rich Jewish banker from the Goldfeder family. Stefania's marriage to Jerzy Skarbek in 1898 helped to improve the finances of the impoverished Count Skarbek while giving Stefania Goldfeder, in return, the status of a Polish countess. With the dowry of Stefania, Count Skarbek bought a small estate, Czepnica. The Countess Skarbek settled on the estate. The Count paid rare visits to Czepnica between his voyages abroad and his endless reveling. Their daughter was born on the 1st of May, 1908. She was baptized into the Roman Catholic faith as Maria Christina Janina. Wspominam z lat dziecięcych Krystynę, która przyjechała do nas w odwiedziny. To jeszcze było jak mieszkaliśmy na ulicy Mochnackiego. 
I ona przyjechała ze swoją koleżanką. Pamiętam, że była dziewczynką, no powiedziałbym 15-16 letnią. Ja przypuszczam, że byłam wtedy 6-7 lat. Odwiedzałem je rano i zaprosiły mnie do łóżka i w tym łóżku opowiadały mnie jakieś dosyć fascynujące historyjki, z których ja bardzo się cieszyłem. Panny z ziemiańskich rodzin bardzo często oddawane były do takich właśnie szkół, między innymi Sacre Cœur i Urszulanki były takie najbardziej znane szkoły i wśród tych właśnie ziemianek była również Krystyna Skarbek. Słyszałem wersję, że jakoby Krysia Skarbek podpaliła księdza w momencie odprawiania przy święty. Jakoby chciała go poddać próbie ognia, czy jest bardziej święty i wytrzyma przy ołtarzu, czy jednak host się położy i zacznie gasić sutannę. To była łatwa sprawa, bo te panienki trzymały jakieś tam świece, więc wychylić się i zapalić sutannę nie było trudno. Nie wiadomo, czy to jest prawda, ale e, takie wersje chodziły i to był jeden z momentów, w którym podobno rozstała się z Sakrykę. It happened in Zakopane. Krystyna Skarbek, a beautiful young lady, her father was a count, her mother a Jewess from the Goldfeder family. The Polish nobility and aristocracy had intermarried with Jews to gild their crowns, but these unions were both uncomfortable and embarrassing. The Polish writer Witold Gombrowicz wrote, The Jewish world, when implanted in the Polish milieu, had an extremely explosive effect. It happened in Zakopane, he wrote. Krystyna Skarbek, a beautiful young lady, belonged to this category of mixed pedigree. Jewish matters were taboo in Christine's presence. She herself would never dwell on it until one day when a catastrophe befell her. She was sitting on a veranda at the front of a hotel in the company of titled dignitaries from high society when in the street one of her Jewish aunts appeared. The Jewish lady who had passed the prime of her life was fat and pretentiously dressed and she was looking for Christina. She shouted, Chrissy! Christine! The members of the high society were stunned. Shocked, Christine stiffened more than the others and instead of answering pretended that the call was not addressed to her. But the calling did not stop. And this time it was beyond any doubt. Chrissy Skarbek! The party froze. Eyes sank, heads bowed down, faces tensed. Everybody was paralyzed by shock. Christine's father died in 1929, having successfully squandered the entire Goldfeder dowry. The Skarbek family had to move to Warsaw. A whimsical craze in those days amongst well-to-do ladies were beauty contests. Christina was chosen one of the most beautiful women in Poland for the year 1930. A brief marriage to Gustav Getlich, a wealthy factory owner from Pabianice, ended in divorce. Unusually, for the Polish upper classes, Christine became an employee of the Fiat car company in Warsaw. The offices were located above the company's garages and the constant inhaling of car exhausts made Christine ill. On the doctor's advice, she went to convalesce in the Polish mountains. In Zakopane, Christine met Jerzy Giżycki, a writer, diplomat and traveller. Giżycki was 20 years her senior. They married in November 1938. When war broke out in September 1939, Christine and Consul Gijitsky were traveling around South Africa. They cut their holiday short 
and at the beginning of October 1939, arrived in London. Christine, and I think Gizitsky too, came to London early in the war. And Christine there met a man called Freddie Voigt. He put her in touch with uh, Sir Robert Van Sittert. So she was recruited for uh, the SIS, the Secret Service. Of course, there was no SOE in those days. And she was sent out to uh, Budapest uh, in the guise of a journalist. Gizitsky bade farewell to Christine as she left for Budapest. Twenty years later, he wrote in his memoirs with great sadness that he had not suspected at the time that he would be losing Christine forever. I met Christina in Budapest in 1940 or early 41. I know that in Hungary uh, she went and disappeared and went to Poland and then she came again. But her marriage to her husband by that time has uh, broken up and she lived with Andre. Andrzej miał samochód Opel, który zdobył, zdobili, czy też on osobiście, na Niemcach i tym Oplem wyjechał z, Pols z Polski na Węgry razem z całą swoją brygadą. I oni zostali internowani przez Węgrów. Andrzejowi udało się tym, że samym Oplem do Węgrzy widocznie patrzyli dosyć pobłażliwie na nich, bo jemu się udało z, tej, z tego obozu tym, że samym Oplem wyjechać. Gdzieś zdobył ubranie cywilne i przebrał się i już udawał, że, że jest całkiem cywil. I jak go pierwszy raz aresztowali w Węgrzy i zarzucili mu, że on jest polskim oficerem, czy też w karbie wojskowym, to powiedział panowie, ja jestem bez nogi. Przecież ja nogi nie mam. Jeżeli ktoś nie wiedział, że ma sztuczną nogę, to dopiero przy pewnych ruchach, przy pewnych tych, mógł stwierdzić, że coś z jego krokiem, czy z jego chodzeniem jest niecałkiem w porządku. In Budapest, Andrzej Kowerski was organizing the escape of Poles to the Polish army being re-established in France. He clandestinely transported Polish soldiers across the Hungarian frontier. Christine invited Kowerski to work for the British intelligence. I wasn't really aware of all the brave things that she did at the time, but she just told me, you don't need more than two dresses and two pairs of shoes, it's quite unnecessary. Really, that was my main memory of her. But she always explained to me that you have to travel light in this life and uh, that's the normal thing. You just don't need all that luggage and all that clutter. You know. I had my 23rd birthday and I was very young. And she said, oh, but you have to love a man so that you don't mind changing his, you know, helping him with his game leg and giving him an enema. I remember she lectured to me about this enema that you have to give to a man. I, I got through life so far, I never had to give an enema, though I would have done it. Christine worked for the British Secret Service, gathering information about the situation in occupied Poland and helping British prisoners of war to escape from the occupied territories. Christina zjawiła się nagle w Zamościu w 40 roku, proszona przez Andrzeja, żeby dotarła do matki. On się po prostu o nią niepokoił, co się z nią dzieje. I Krystyna zjawiła się u mojej matki w Zamościu, przywożąc mały grips od Andrzeja i opowiadając o jego losach. List, który został wysłany z Warszawy, był od Krystyny napisany bardzo ostrożnie z wiadomościami o moim ojcu, o którym nie wiedzieliśmy prawie nic od momentu upadku Francji. While in Budapest, Christine had crossed the frontier four times, traveling illegally to occupied Poland. Each time she risked arrest, interrogation and even death from the hands of the Gestapo. Włodzimierz Leduchowski was also a courier. He worked for the Polish Home Army. Twice in 
Twice Christine crossed into Poland with him and they became intimate friends. Książkę o Krystynie miał pisać mój mąż, bo on był pisarzem. On oprócz tego Il Met by Moonlight napisał parę książek, um, ale niestety właśnie został alkoholikiem i to się nie ruszało. A powiedzmy to, co Leduchowski napisał o spotkaniu z Krystyną, było bardzo ładnie napisane. Ja to tłumaczyłam z polskiego na angielski. Spotykają się na małej stacji. Um, tak ona, jak i on, jadą do Polski. Um, ona stoi w jakimś takim miejscu, gdzie słońce pada jej na twarz i um, opala się. Zaczyna się romans, ale jest ślicznie opisany. She, you know, as he wrote, sort of looked at him charmingly. Her eyes would uh, glisten and sparkle, and uh, he called them almond eyes. And uh, they started talking, and she asked him, you know, have you got a girl? And he said, no, I'm, I'm on my own. And she said, well, I'm free. And uh, when, by the time they got to Budapest, he assumed that they were what today you'd call partners or boyfriend and girlfriend. They moved into her flat uh, in, in Budapest, and there they found uh, a chap called Radzimiski staying there. And uh, uh, Christine said um, to Radzimiski, thank you for looking after my flat, can you now go? And just before he left, uh, my father said to Radzimiski, look, I've got a good friend in Budapest called Andrew Kowerski, because I met him here a few months earlier. Do you think you could give me his phone number? And Christina said, no, 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 don't phone him yet, darling. Please don't phone him yet. We have to be together. So my father didn't phone Kowerski. And uh, they spent the night together again in her flat. And then for he stayed in Budapest for another nearly three months. Uh, and uh, during this time, he saw a lot of Christine. She told him again that they were, she was deeply in love with him, he with her. He bought her some uh, glass uh, diamond beads. They weren't real diamonds, but they, they looked like diamonds. Uh, then later, towards the end, she told him, Andrew is very much in love with me, but I can't tell him about our love affair because uh, that would hurt him. So that, that actually is a real truth. But as soon as um, we're off to Poland again, then we'll be back together as boyfriend and girlfriend. And so it happened that the Poles decided to send my father to Poland again in early June. Uh, it happened that the British decided to send Christina at the same time, also in early June. And so the two of them uh, went across again on the very dangerous journey. Christina was very tired and uh, she kept on saying that she was tired and that she wanted to go by train. And so eventually they decided to take the last part of the journey by train. Uh, they crossed the border into Poland uh, and they were waiting at a railway station on the border to go into Poland, which of course was a very silly thing to do because that was uh, very, very dangerous. Uh, when some uh, Czechoslovak border guards uh, came up to them and asked for their papers and uh, the guards took them away and started questioning them. And in her case, they found the photographs of the Polish commander-in-chief, General Sikorski, who was at that moment in France. So they were very suspicious and decided, no, no, you are agents, um, and you're not just innocent travelers. So the two of them were then marched along the railway lines uh, towards Gestapo station. They went over a bridge, uh, and while they were on the bridge, my father pretended to fall and he fell down and he dropped a lot of papers into the water, which then started flowing away. And on the other side of the bridge, uh, Christina suddenly started saying, oh, I'm very weak, I've hurt my leg, I've hurt my leg, which was partly true because she was actually feeling rather unwell. And uh, the, the guards came up to her and she started whispering to them. And then she took um, the necklace and she showed them the necklace and they grabbed the necklace and she said oh they're my diamonds when she started making a big noise a lot of hysteria about her diamonds and scratching their faces and then they fought over the necklace and the so-called diamonds these bits of glass started rolling down into the river and the two guards started running down the hill to the water to run after the diamonds and more money which had also fallen down and at this moment uh, my father and Christina decided to escape uh, they ran up the hill uh, into the forests. Uh, the guards turned around and started shooting at them and chased them up into the mountains, but they weren't hit. 
and finally they escaped. <laughs> Wszystko musiałam oddać dokładnie Wokulskiemu? Tak. Jemu bardzo chodziło o to, żeby, tak jak mówię, żeby Krystyna wyszła jako biała linia. A Krystyna była kwiatem wojny. One of the first activities we were called upon to work with was to help a young Polish officer who fallen in love with Christine, who was organizing a private enterprise escape route for Poles from Poland to join the French forces in France. And this young man had fallen deeply in love with her and to such an extent that he decided to commit suicide and had jumped into the river but uh, omitted to look and see that it was frozen and so all that had happened was he'd broken both legs and we had to help get him out from Budapest back to Paris to join his forces there. Ona była agentką brytyjską, Polka. Oni musieli mieć takich agentów oczywiście. Przechodzenie przez granicę to było dla niej, to była dla niej przygoda. Niczego złego oni powiedzieć nie mogę, nie mam żadnego powodu. Przypuszczalnie wykonywała swoją funkcję dobrze. Dobry kurier musiał mieć, musiał mieć tendencję do przygody. Nie każdy ma tę tendencję, nie każdy chce, nie każdy potrafi. Dobry kurier musi być raz Brytyjczykiem, raz Polakiem, raz Niemcem, jeżeli zna języki. Nazi terror in occupied Poland had intensified. In her last journey to Warsaw, Christine had implored her mother to escape, but to no avail. Krystyna wszystkimi możliwymi argumentami błagała matkę, żeby z nią wyjechała, ale matka się nie skończyła. Stefania Goldfeder perished in the Warsaw Ghetto. Andrzej i Krystyna byli aresztowani przez Gestapo i e, dzieci niesłychanej jakiejś przytomności Krystyny oni zostali wypuszczeni, a stało się to w ten sposób, że Krystyna wiedziała... Christine knew that when she was ill, whilst working in the offices of Fiat, the severe infections had left scars on her lungs. This knowledge came in useful when she and Andrew were arrested. Wobec tego w czasie przesłuchania ugryzła się w całej siły w język i zaniosła się kaszle, plując krwią. Niemcy się potwornie bali tej gruźnicy i zarazy i sprowadzili doktora Węgra zresztą, który zbadał ją, zrobił rentgen i powiedział im, słuchajcie, to jest kobieta w ostatnim stanie gruźnicy, co wy tu ją trzymacie. The Germans released Christine and Andrew from detention, but continued to follow them and to spy on their every movement. A senior British diplomat in Budapest, Sir Owen O'Malley, immediately arrived with aid. He gave Christine and Andrew British passports and helped them to escape from Budapest. Kristina Skarbek became Christine Granville and Andrzej Kowerski became Andrew Kennedy. She is enormously brave, wrote Sir Owen about Christine in his report. She is prepared to sacrifice everything without hesitation for the ideas she believes in and is devoted to. Christine was smuggled across the frontier in the boot of Sir Owen's official car. However, Kowerski did not want to part with his beloved Oppo, so he risked crossing the border in it. They traveled through Belgrade, on through Bulgaria, Turkey, and further into the Middle East in Kowerski's Opel. In Cairo, they were greeted with distrust and suspicion, a result of allegations brought forward by the Polish Secret Service. The next thing I heard was that Christine had arrived with Andrew Kennedy in Cairo in the circumstances that occurred then. It was believed very difficult for an individual to travel from Hungary, in this case, through Turkey to Cairo without being uh, authorized to do so by the Germans. Próbowali z nich robić, nie wiem, szpiegów, to tam, to gdzieś. Jest zawiść. Jak ktoś, ja to zauważyłam. Um, 
polski wywiad mu tak w drogę wchodził i jemu i Krystynie. The other Polish underground organizations uh, disapproved of them or distrusted them or were jealous of them or uh, had some other reason uh, to uh, imply that they were dangerous people, uh, security risks and the rest we had to do them better. Ich podejrzewali o to, że oni pracują na dwie strony. Livia Deakin had been working for the Romanian section of the British Secret Service and she and Christine became friends. Christine came to me and she said, you are Lord. I said, yes, let come and join us. I was touched that she came to see you are Lord. So when she had no, no room and I had one room, I said, come and we share the room. Patrick Howarth made it possible for Christine to continue her work for the SOE. I arranged for Christine to take a course as a radio operator. Uh, and that pleased her because it made her feel that she was possibly back in action. Uh, and Andrew, who had an artificial leg, I arranged for him to do a parachute course. And he passed that with a distinction. And after that, uh, he was taken back into regular employment. There was, in fact, a small radio station on the roof of Ruston Buildings, and Christine came there in order to learn to be a wireless operator. And we used to see her trying to do this, and she used to, oh, we were, can't do it, and it's impossible, and this kind of thing, you know. So she, in the end, I think they gave up on that, and they decided that if she went into the field, it would be better for her to be um, a courier. She used to come into the office and as soon as she came in, all the men stopped working. We had a very austere colonel called Colonel Mears who used to sit there with his nose to, the, to the, his books. When Christine came in, he'd leap up, do sit down and this kind of thing. But she had to have a British Army pass. So Christine went off to the officer's shop, fitted with a uniform. And um, we had two uniforms, one Barathea winter uniform, and we had a, a, a summer uniform made of khaki drill, and therefore we had two sets of buttons. And there weren't any fanny buttons um, available, so I lent her my spare set, which was for my khaki drill set. We were, we were still in our winter uniforms at the time. And so she put these into the uniform, and I think it was about the only time she wore the uniform. And that's the photograph that's in the, her past. It's in Madeleine Masson's book. Uh, General Stowell, who had been appointed overall commander of special operations in the Mediterranean, turned up in Algiers at that time and authorised Christine to go into France. She was duly parachuted in to join Roger, Francis Camus. Do you remember this? I got a copy of this. It's signed by you in October 44. Look, I you doubt whether I've ever seen it. You must have seen because it's Oh, yeah, I signed it. <laughs> no, you must have written it. No. as you Christine was parachuted to Vassieux in southern France to work as a courier. Christine's name in France was Pauline Armand. Patrick was dropped into France, to Francis Camerts, and then because it was so well organized in France, he went over into Italy, and Christine was the person who, the link between Francis and Patrick. Patrick had the most profound admiration for Francis, but I've never talked to Francis about Christine, so I only know everything secondhand. What Patrick had said about her, who, and he just he told me it's a fact that Christine was in love with Francis, but um, how he knew this, I don't know. On the 14th of July, 1944, the Germans suddenly attacked Marquise in Vercors.
Kamatz and his people suffered large casualties. Chrissy and I, on the 14th of July, lay in a burning hotel. Quite sure we were going to die the next day. So we lay in each other's arms. The next morning we got out and we stood at the window in a German plane and we could see the face of the pilot and we could see the bomb carried underneath. And I said, if he releases the bomb now, it'll come right in the window next to us. And when I said now, he released the bomb. And it passed over the roof and brushed the roof, you could feel it, and buried itself in a bank the other side and didn't go off. And we just walked out and looked at the bomb and said they don't want us to die. Christian was on the French-Italian border. I was arrested in the with uh, Sam Fielding and uh, Major Sorensen. Uh, simply one of those accidental occasions which you could never be sure wouldn't happen. Uh, there was an air raid and we knew that the Germans got very active. Our papers were perfectly in order, but by oversight and being a little pressed for time, we didn't realize that some of the cash that had been received for us. And the, I, we, I had a few notes and uh, Zan Fielding had a few notes and they were in the same sequence. And when the German intelligence officer saw this, he said, right, you're saying you don't know each other. And here you are. Christine was the one with the courage and the imagination and the daredevilness to be able to go in and get him out. She immediately came down from the Italian frontier and tried to get together a commando to do a, a forceful release. And it was just, there wasn't time. She got into contact with a French gendarme who we knew was a double agent. He said if she could produce two million francs, uh, he could make an arrangement with the Germans. Two million francs were immediately dropped to them by parachute by the SOE headquarters in Algiers, which amounted to a year's salary of a gendarme. It opened the way for Christine to get in touch with Max Vam, a Belgian who was the head of the Gestapo in Dean. Christine introduced herself as a niece of General Montgomery. Max Vam succumbed to this unbelievable lie. She threatened him with revenge if anything happened to her or to her arrested comrades. French resistance weren't going to let him get away. And he then said, all right, well, if you save my life, I'll save their lives. Max Vam secured the release of Kamerz and two other officers from prison. In a German army vehicle, he drove them all, together with Christine, out of occupied territory to the closest Allied stronghold. She should have had the nerve to say, I'm General Montgomery's niece. <laughs> if anybody had been there who spoke English, they would have at once dreamed that she wasn't General Montgomery's niece. But with such assurance. Max Baum was sent to Nice, where the British military had already established a large presence. The French would almost certainly have executed him. And Christine and I had considerable difficulty in London to persuade the British authorities. Our argument was simply this, without 
the reputation of British officers, we wouldn't be alive today. And if you leave Max in prison, you are in fact breaking our promise, uh, which destroys the very thing which has saved our lives. In the German troops of occupation in the south of France, there were a very large number of forced uh, Polish-speaking people. And in fact, Christine had a lot of work to do with uh, the Germans in uniform, who were in fact Poles. Immediately after the liberation of Gap, Christine spoke to 2,000 Poles and asked them if they would go and uh, help oppose a German counterattack that was suspected. And she said, you can't go in German uniform. You'll have to take your uh, jackets off. And as she said that, 2,000 soldiers took their jackets off and threw them in the air. I asked her which decoration she wanted. She said, I don't like officers. So the only one I'm interested in is the military medal. The military medals are the ordinary soldier's decoration if he's an ordinary soldier. But for anyone else, it's the rarest of all. It's indicative of Christine's preferences. But the only one she was interested in was the only one that you couldn't possibly have got for her. She was enormously proud. And, uh, she had lived through a sort of curious childhood with her Jewish mother and the anti-Semitic drunken father. She had lived in scattered wealth. She didn't feel at all embittered by that, but I believe that coloured her attitude to money. Uh, her attitude to money was simply as far as I could work out, didn't exist. <laughs> Christine would have hated any form of publicity. W jesieni 1944 roku byłem we Włoszech jako członek projektowanej misji brytyjskiej do Armii Krajowej. Wiem, że były projektowane inne misje do Polski. E z których jednak, o ile mi wiadomo, żadna nie doszła do skutku. Między innymi zaangażowani w tym mieli być i Krystyna Skarbek i Kowerski. In March 1945, Christine wrote to Major Perkins, the head of SOE operations in Central and Eastern Europe, in great anguish about the aborted mission to Poland. For God's sake, do not strike my name off the list while the firm still exists. Remember that I'm always too pleased to go and do anything for it. Perhaps I could be useful getting people out from camps and prisons in Germany. I should love to do it, and I like to jump out of a plane, even every day. Please, Perks, if you've got nothing for me in your section, maybe somebody else does. trying to get a job for her immediately after the war, um, unsuccessfully. I think because people didn't understand Christine, they didn't know what kind of work she would have enjoyed doing. And the last thing she would have accepted would have been to be in an office from nine to four. The post-war period was a particularly difficult and depressing time for Polish political emigres in London. They were barred from returning to Poland by the Cold War that had prevailed in war-ravished Europe. The British economy was in a poor state. Food rationing lasted up until 1952. The labour market was limited especially to foreigners, no matter how distinguished and helpful they might have been to the Allies in the war efforts. The loss of hope of returning to a free Poland deepened frustration and filled people with bitterness. Christine used to come and visit myself and 
Andrew, my husband, in our flat in London when we were first married. Always travelling, moving like a bird on the wing, and I found her English was absolutely fantastic. And she used to talk to Andrew, of course, in Polish, and she talked to me in English, and we found we had a mutual interest in horses. She used to show jump before the war, and we had an enormous amount of interest in this. We didn't talk much about the past or what went on during the war, because this was a very difficult time for her, and she was trying to put it behind her and make a new life. She loved my little daughter. She may had some Polish um, artisans that she knew of in England, make the most beautiful family crest, all covered in leather with the crest on it, and so on, which used to hang about my daughter's bed. Był taki znany bardzo krup polski, biały orzeł, który mieszczący się vis a vis ambasady francuskiej, gdzie odbywały się najróżniejsze spotkania, no i naturalnie bale. Tam właśnie spotkałam kiedyś Krystynę i parokrotnie z nią się widziałam. Kowerski decided to live in Munich, but he continued to visit London and he and Christine saw each other regularly. However, Christine did not want to settle in Germany. Ja przypuszczam, że on się w niej bardzo kochał i że ona była dla niego rozczarowaniem, ponieważ jemu bardzo zależało, żeby ona się jakoś ustabilizowała, a ona nie była w stanie się ustabilizować. Dostałam pracę w High Commissioner of India. Ja pracowałam w restauracji, a ona była sprzątaczką. Nigdy nie narzekała i zawsze brałyśmy życie takie, jak było. Jeżeli coś, co tośmy się śmiały, bośmy widziały komiczność sytuacji. Ogromnie namawiała mnie w pewnym momencie do wyjazdu do Kenii. Wtedy w ogóle Kenia się zrobiła bardzo modna. Po co ona przyjechała? Ja nie wiem. Myśmy byli redaktorami gazety miejscowej i Krystyna przyjechała i był jeden polski major, taki łącznikowy, i, który znał Krystynę jeszcze z Londynu i on ją przyprowadził do nas na całym świecie, prawda? Ona z nie była związana nie. wtedy. Nie, ona była rzeczywiście wtedy bardzo fizycznie się bardzo źle czuła i miała straszne problemy z żołądkiem, nerwy. To się wszystko zaczęło odbijać. Krystyna nie mogła, że tak powiem, zapomnieć o przeszłości. To było, ona musiała mieć straszne sny, bo to była straszna praca, proszę Pani. Pani sobie wyobraża zadźgać człowieka na zimno. Czy przespać się z kimś, dlatego żeby uratować się. O tym, wie pan, na ten temat się nie mówiła, ale... Nie można było od niej wyciągnąć e, żadnych opowieści z jej e, przygód e, z okresu wojny. Krystyna pani powiedziała to, co ona chciała, żeby pani wiedziała. Ona była tak wytresowanym agentem, ona pani ona opowiadała, męż jaki był pabianica, jaki bogaty, był szalenie bogaty. O Giżyckim nigdy nic nie mówiła. Spotkałam ją kiedyś, powiedziała mi, że się spodziewałam dziecka pierwszego i ona powiedziała, o Boże Święty, coś ty zrobiła. <laughs> Miałam pieska, którego szalenie lubiłam i chciałam wyjechać na dwa tygodnie do Francji i nie wiedziałam, co z tym zrobić. Krysia wtedy spokojnie powiedziała, słuchaj, ja będę babysitować bardzo chętnie, zamieszkam w twoim wynajętym, zresztą małym, mieszka umeblowanym mieszkanku i zajmę się psem. I rzeczywiście tak się stało. Pies był szczęśliwy. Ja po powrocie nie wiedziałam, czy on należy do Krysi, czy do mnie. Tak ją pokochał. Krysia miała wyjątkowy zupełnie yy, stosunek do zwierząt, a szczególnie do psów. I ona, która nigdy w każdym razie w mojej obecności nie mówiła o swoich działaniach w czasie wojny, tylko jedno mi kiedyś opowiedziała, jeden epizod, że gdzieś kiedyś jakoś zrzucona nad Francją siedziała ukryta w krzakach. 
i Niemcy wiedzieli, że jakiś samolot, że coś się tu działo. Puścili psy, wilczury i jeden z tych wilczurów doszedł do Krysi. I ona wiedziała, że jeżeli zacznie szczekać, czy w ogóle pokaże swoim panom, że tam ktoś jest, no to koniec jej życia. Otóż pies ją obwąchał, ona go pogłaskała, coś mu tam powiedziała, prawdopodobnie po polsku. I pies zakręcił ogonem i spokojnie wrócił do swoich władców. I Krysi się nic nie stało. I następna rzecz, myśmy się dowiedzieli, ona pływa. To nikt nie mógł zrozumieć, co, co ona, jak ona pływa, co ona robi. A friend who knew Christine from the same social circles in pre-war Warsaw encouraged her to work on cruise ships. Kanka Nicole, która pracowała jako stewardessa na statkach, które kiedyś przed wojną przewoziły polskich emigrantów z Polski do Argentyny. Ale po wojnie oczywiście nie było tego stanowiska oficerskiego i Hanka pracowała jako zwyczajna stewardessa, ale dzięki temu zarabiała dobrze. Przywoziła nam zawsze doskonałe mięso z Argentyny. I Krysie namówiła na próbę, po prostu żeby Krysia spróbowała tego zawodu. Whilst working as a stewardess on the liner Ruahin, Christine met an Irish ship steward called Dennis Muldowney. Muldowney had fallen in love with Christine in a desperate, obsessive way. Christine, wishing to free herself from Muldowney, changed ships. Humiliated and miserable, Muldowney gave up working at sea and found himself a job as a porter in one of London's clubs and waited for Christine to return from her voyages. She rang me up. She was back from South Africa. And she said, I'm very tired. Can I come and stay with you? I don't want any food, I just want to sleep. So I said, do. The next day when I opened the paper, Dennis Muldowney was sentenced to death and hanged. Christine's funeral took place on the 21st of June 1952 in the Catholic Cemetery at Kensal Green in London. Newspapers widely publicized photographs from the funeral as well as photographs of Andrew Kowerski. After the funeral he said could he come because he felt he couldn't see you know all the, his Polish friends it would be too difficult for him. He said, yes, of course, you know, stay as long as you want. I don't know how long it was, I can't remember. Not all that long, probably. But um, I think he just sort of couldn't face it. The people, everybody who knew her very well. It was clear to her close friends that the media worldwide would try and make a huge story out of this that this would fantasize quite wrongly the nature of Christine's life and of Christine's death. Uh, that is why the four of us, John Roper, myself, Patrick Howard, and Andy Kennedy, uh, got together with the determination that Christine's reputation wouldn't be sullied by the obvious foolish interventions of the media throughout the world. Newspapers fabricated various sensational stories, such as that there was a communist conspiracy behind Christine's death, or that she was murdered because she knew too much about the circumstances of General Sikorsky's death in 1943. Such a theory was also suggested by Donald McCormick, in his biography of Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond. 23 years after Christine's death, the book Christine, A Search for Christine Granville, written by Madeleine Masson, was published. When we agreed that Madeleine Masson should write her book, it was because the four of us felt certain that a book was bound to be written. 
and we thought it was safer to work with Madeleine rather than uh, risk the, uh, there were various other people trying to write books. So as soon as it was published I went along and bought myself a copy uh, which I kept in my flat in London where I started work and I was very proud. Uh, my father got two or three pages, maybe, you know, maybe there were very truncated, uh, distorted version of uh, my father's three months with Christine, but nevertheless he was there. But um, I, I wouldn't admit to my father that I had this book and a few years later he came to visit me in the late 70s and uh, he just found it in my bookshelves and he was really upset. In 1998, the Polish writer Maria Nurowska published the novel Miłośnica. A literary critic, Jerzy Krzyżanowski, wrote in a review, The very title of this book suggests negative and vulgar connotations regarding Christine's personality. In Polish, Miłośnica means Paramour, seductress, femme fatale. When uh, Christine was murdered, Camus got a letter from Max from Belgium saying, Both of us owe Christine saving our lives. He wrote to me and said what a wonderful woman she had been. I uh, wrote back and said, our promise didn't include friendly communication. Będąc tutaj w 1988 roku w lecie, rozmawiał ze mną o swoim pogrzebie, że zastanawia się, że on będzie spalony oczywiście, ale zastanawia się, gdzie mają być pochowane jego prochy ponieważ wiedział, że jest bardzo ciężko chory, że to jest rak. John Roper, who had, had made himself responsible for looking after Christine's grave, asked me if I could design the lettering for the additional stone that would mark Andrew's remains. And as the lettering on Christine's grave was to some extent special, and I think it was a Polish-inspired design, I designed the lettering for Andrew's stone. Thirty-seven years had passed since Christine's death, when Andrew's remains were buried alongside her in her grave. Christine's decorations, in accordance to Koverski's will, were left in the care of Christine's cousins, Andrzej and Jan Skarbek. In 2011, the Skarbek family gave Christine's wartime decorations to the Sikorsky Museum in London. Tak jak powiedzmy na a, polach Flandry zakwitły maki, to ona była tym wspaniałym, cudownym kwiatem, którego ta wojna wywołała skądś tam. She wasn't the sort of person whom you could ever imagine being old and settling down to a, a normal life. Mm. Though she might have gone to Africa to raise elephants or protect animals, that sort of life I would have seen as normal for her. <laughs> Czy ma 
mam pierwsza ci rzec, czy mam do nóg ci lec, czy mam błagać o twoje zmiłowanie. Jeśli niebo nas czeka, to weź mi niebo, jeśli piekło, to nasza jest rzecz. Kogo nasza miłość obchodzi, tylko ciebie i mnie. Komu nasza miłość zaszkodzi, tylko tobie i mnie. Komu oczu łzami wypije, tylko tobie i mnie. Kogo nasza miłość zabije, tylko tobie i mnie.